Uh, welcome to the Man in Line, this off the back of the present politics programme. I'm glad to say all my three guests are staying on. Alison Lynch, uh, Moran Commissioners, uh, Chris Thomas, Policy and Reform Minister, and David Cretney, MLC, but of course uh, with a whole plethora of... Uh, of portfolios behind him to answer questions on. Um, we'd like to get your contributions in. Obviously, we've had quite a few already, but more will be welcome. Remember, we do need to keep, I'm quoting here, keep things within reason, so what you say must be legal, honest, decent and truthful. We've covered a lot of subjects already. I want to cover a couple of other subjects as well. Uh, the meat plant, obviously, which is up for discussion. The idea of having a deep water, or a cruise berth outside our window. Well, not outside our window, but you know what I mean. In the sea down there has also come up. But first, the, the the problem of uh, paying for pensions. Uh, one of our um, listeners has actually um, given us a contribution on that. Let me just find it again, if I what can find it. it yes, can, sorry. Can I have the chance to respond to Chris? You, you oh, raised course, a yes. challenge. Indeed, I did. I raised a challenge. About, 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 about the Social Affairs so, Policy Review Committee. Yeah. So can I just say, we've at the moment, we've got the Knockfield uh, Historic Child Abuse. We've got Under Two's Nursery Provision. We've got Mental Health Issues. And we've recently finished the Dependability Review. Our remit is education, health and home affairs. So my only concern would be about that, that... You know, there are other government departments which I believe a champion could look at as well. Yeah, do you feel that you, the gauntlet's been thrown back at you there no, successfully? It's, it's, that's a good point that David makes. And we also have to remember uh, that uh, the the support for the work of a chair and the members of a policy review committee is, is less than that for a government department. So I think government's got to take on the issues of the elderly. Um, also, Parliament has, and conceivably there is a role for an older champion, but um, we're not persuaded because it works really well for the Equality Champion. A colleague of David's, Jane Paul Wilson, is doing an excellent job in that brief. But um, our worry in the Council Ministers is that it's been pretty hard for the Children's Champion to do her role, because if I just compare that with in England, the Children's Commissioner across has 19 members of staff. That politician doesn't have any staff. She has to do it herself, and it's very hard to actually do something properly without any um, government staff and we're a small island with a small public service and we have to remember the reality of that. Let's just move on to the uh, public sector pensions uh, shortfall. We've had this contribution in from uh, one of our listeners basically saying um, it's 2022 I think is the figure that's given now. Uh, what happens then they say is the Isle of Man bankrupt? Well this was raised up uh, in, uh, was it Keys or Timbald I think anyway, Rob Callister uh, yeah, questioned uh, the time scale of tackling the £3.9 billion liability in the Keys. The Treasury Minister Alfred Cannon offered this response he said the issue is being addressed with government officials and the public sector pensions authority designing proposals to come before Timbald next year. If he thinks that no action is taken then he ought to really ask current government uh, employees who are all paying much more now towards their pensions than they were, who are all facing potential question marks about the type of returns that they will see at the end of their careers. And the Honourable Member will know that even in Timwald now, the same type of benefits uh, and opportunities that were available before are no longer available as new members are put onto new schemes. And we will continue to work to refine these pension schemes until we get to a sustainable solution. That's what we all want to do as soon as we've got the accurate properly costed, realistic figures with appropriate actions alongside, then we will be <coughs> back with those proposals. So you can understand our listeners' concern, a sustainable figure. We haven't got there yet, it seems. So that means that uh, uh, these people who are looking forward to their pensions can also look forward to contributing more in the near future and also getting uh, to retire later on. Is that right, Mr Thomas? Yeah, that, that is right. Um, fair play to public servants in our schemes. This last 12 months, they've agreed to reduce the value of the benefits they're going to get and to pay more into the scheme. Only teachers and the judiciary are currently outside that settlement, and I'm hoping that by, by April next year, those groups of uh, public servants will be inside as well. And um, where we are with the 58 million uh, legacy gap funding is that we've got an 80 page actuarially informed document that's being discussed in Treasury and Cabinet Office to deal with what happens after 2022. Um, the gap won't be as large because as yet we haven't uh, been able to inform the public what we managed to do to that gap by the changes that we've already made but I expect in February it's comforting um, to know it won't be as large, but it will be quite substantial. Yeah, we've still. got a problem. We've got a problem that that um, was created over three decades, um, and now we, this group of politicians has got to deal with a, an, an issue that's been there for at least two decades, um, known about. And we're trying. Um, we, I laid out in um, Timwald a whole range of options that we're considering. 
Um, and uh, council ministers will consider that report just after Christmas, I believe, and then it'll come to Timwood, I believe, in February, if not in March. And so the public will have a, a better idea about the challenges we've got and how we propose to deal with them. David Cretney, obviously it's concerning. I mean, are we looking at sort of 7.5% increase in things, a 10% increase to actually pay for this? It sounds like there's a long way to go before this problem is solved, this liability problem. Yes, if just in response to Chris... Uh, it is a challenging issue, and I, I, I think that he, the Public Care Sector Pensions Authority, are, are doing a really good job, and the staff have been understanding and are, wor- and are working with them. I, I think that's a good sign. All I would say is that previously, when it was first raised, um, the actuarial reports which which we received didn't indicate the situation to be as drastic as subsequently Aren't it turned out to be. Are these people paid oh, to yeah, actually absolutely. sort out the problem or to tell you what the problem is anyway? Yeah, well then what happens is politicians get criticised because the uh, actuarial people got it wrong, you know. So, so we're the ones who, you know, but we're not expert in that field. So have we any comeback against these actuarial no. people? No. <laughs> Not at all. They just got it wrong. But we, but we also have to remember that the world is different now. So, yeah. so David yeah. makes a very fair point. But the reason why the liability yeah. has gone up by nearly eight hundred million in the last twelve months is nothing whatsoever to do, pretty much, with anything that the public servants have or haven't done. What it's to do with is the way the interest rates have yeah. moved and other assumptions have moved. Yeah. So the world has changed. It's not only our situation. We're in a worse position than I'd like to be in, but we are in the position that we're in, and we will have a coherent plan that makes sense. We're definitely not bankrupt. The Isle of Man has £1.85 billion in reserves. The Isle of Man has a £3.8 billion actuarial liability that could come down by £800 million in the next few years and certainly will have a plan for the next five or six decades to deal with it. That is reassuring, Minister. Um, I was talking to Alison Lynch earlier and she was saying how nice to see the Christmas lights on. Well, Chris is joining us. Chris, you've got a, um, a bugbear about the, the timing of the Douglas lights, have you? Hello, Chris McAvoy, can you uh, hear me? Oh, right. I'm online. You, you are online. I'm light. sorry. Yes. I know you've been waiting in queue for quite a time. Uh, but you think the Christmas lights were on too early? Well, it's about the tax thing. And I'm thinking, uh, how much does the Manx taxpayer pay for these lights that we... Uh, they are uh, totally too early. Uh, that uh, the, the Manx government want to save £25 million pounds. Uh, yeah, why put them on so soon? It's not fair on the children. Could it get them excited? Because everybody, it's commercialism. They are on too early. And I personally, uh, I'm not Scrooge. I'm not a humbug. But there, that's how you can save. Uh, Isn't the idea to get everybody excited? They spend more money and the government gets more tax out of them because they're spending more money or the commercial taxes are uh, greater? Cause... I'd, I'd like to know. I tried to find out, but I couldn't. How much electricity and the cost of the environment. And the second one uh, is um, how we could save millions of pounds is um, not to subsidise Manx Radio. The amount of losses that you've used... I don't think millions comes income. into it. <laughs> It, we uh, made a yes, loss of eighty-two thousand pounds. We get a subsidy of something like yeah, eight hundred thousand pounds. Eight hundred, and you're asking for a, an extra couple of hundred million for an extension. And we sorry, did you say a couple of hundred years. million? <laughs> it's not no. quite that much. Yeah, I, I know we are. The, the Manx Radio is looking for an extension at the moment, um, yeah. but do you think that shouldn't happen? Why don't the other independent stations get that money? You have asked it and you've been getting it and you're making losses. Why no, well, let is me, that the case? Yeah, you use the word independent. That's why they're not getting their money, because they're independent. Can I just ask your first question? Put your first question. Um, gentlemen uh, and lady yeah. inside the studio, should we be saving money and not putting the lights on until, say, the well, 23rd or something? Well, the Christmas tree lights are a local authority function, so it's not costing the taxpayer a penny. And I, th- I actually think that the putting the lights on when they did is about the right time I think they do it and I have to say the display I'm, I, I've been around the island but the display in Douglas this year is wonderful and so it will encourage people to come in spend money in the shops which is so important for the small independent businesses Chris Thomas 
uh, yeah, if, if you could leave an email or a phone number, I'll get you the exact figure that Douglas uh, spends yeah. on lights and uh, get it sent to you or send it to you to myself. It's not that much, and I genuinely think that what we need in our island is uh, our celebrations like this throughout the year. That's why we've just launched our special year um, which next year to coordinate these things. In terms of Manx Radio, if it, um, if it helps, um, we have a debate coming up about the whole nature of public service broadcasting, but um, in probably in March, April time. But just look around us in the studio. It's not free to make a programme like this. It actually takes production. It actually takes preparation by the um, broadcasters involved, and that's what costs. We don't subsidise Manx Radio. What we do is government provides money for public service broadcasting, which goes to culture, arts, environment, public affairs, all the sorts of things that are inside the public service broadcasting brief. Alison Lynch, your lights, they're on at the moment. Do you think they're on too early? Um, but how much are they costing you, do you know? Very little. I mean, in Moran, we have, um, I think it's four Christmas trees, one in Balagari, one in Crosby, one at the Braid and one in Foxdale, um, and four sets of lights which are used year after year. They don't go up until December. The lights don't come on until December. But can I just say, as far as the Douglas lights are concerned, I think they're fantastic. Um, this year, they're, they're better than they've ever been. Chris, um, Chris, do you think the Douglas lights are good? I think they're wonderful. No problem there, but they're too early, and the children get excited, the parents do. And I think it's commercialism. Um, You're quite right, it is commercial, as I will agree. We'll have to leave it there, Chris, because we've got, amongst other people, um, Howard Quayle on the line. Now, I'm not sure, Howard, is this the Howard Quayle? Or it's no, a different no, Howard no, Quayle, no, it isn't. No, okay. well, you're safe enough, you can uh, all get back all right. to again now. Uh, you're, you're talking about means testing for social housing. Yeah, please. Uh, just listen to that chap ahead there talking about the uh, Christmas... Most places are doing this sort of thing and they're saying it's commercialisation. And then the second complaint was the subsidies to Max Radio. Well, if you didn't have a radio of that type available to the public, that man would not have been able to come on a complaint because he did just have to request a record or something. Mm -hmm. uh, at least you have the facilities there to complain. And this you can do it every day of the week, all year round. Uh, so the facilities are ideal for the the public and there uh, for them to put their points of view well thank you for that cost a couple of bob and uh, means testing for social housing though you think yeah, that's important uh, just a question um i'm almost forgotten what was it? if the um, this is for uh, either david cretney or and uh, david I, I know david and david knows me uh, and for mr thomas the means testing are, are proposed for the council housing and social housing across the island um, if in Doug, well, in Douglas we have the five-year plan now. If the housing rent has changed because of the means testing brackets, will that tenant automatically be taken out of his what is their long-term tenancy and put on a five-year term? And what will happen if their incomes come down? Will it be going back to um, a sort of reasonable rent? I can see Alison Lynch shaking her head, but let's go to Mr. Cretney first of all. I was going to... Um, Chris was involved in th this. Oh, shall we go to Chris then? Yeah. Chris Thomas, yeah. Now, now well, these are really good questions, and I think they go to the heart of it, and they show how difficult it really is, <coughs> because if we're going to do means testing on rents, we have to have accurate information about the income that people are earning now. And, for instance, your income tax is only available inside the system, if it's ever available at all, with your consent, a number of um, years even after the actual event. So you've hit the nail on the head. The Minister of Infrastructure... Um, and now the housing authorities have got difficult um, decisions to make. Um, they'll do it with public consultation, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if there are not announcements like it in future and, and very perceptive questions because you get to the heart of it. And, yeah, and one, one it, of the, it can I add? I interrupt you there, but one of the problems occurring, a lot of people are going to fall into this trap now where they're coming into maybe a company pension plus the state pension, and it's going to put their... Depending how well they um, they got their pension scheme at their pl uh, place of work, they're going to fall into the trap now of having uh, an income 
maybe slightly larger than what they were when they were working. Exactly, and also capital assets and how do you take those into account. And uh, it, the issues, are, practical issues are massive. I think the minister's got a good uh, idea and I think I'm hoping that we can have put some clarity here within the next few months. Um, we've, Alison, we've already heard from you, but would you like to add something to that? I, I just agree with, um, with what Chris has said. Um, you know, I, I don't think the... Uh, Bringing in means testing is not going to have people out on the street homeless. It's, um, you know, people will be paying um, rent in accordance to their income and their savings. And wh- and why shouldn't they? Uh, well, I have to... Uh, sorry, yes, Dave. Yeah, Just my quick point is that over the past several years, the <coughs> local authority rents have gone up something over 25%. And my concern is that along at the same time, there hasn't been any consideration of the person's ability to pay who's within that property. And it's caused real difficulties for a number of people that I'm well aware of. That's why yeah. I think it would be fairer to have some s- s- means or needs test to help. Mm. Well, thanks very much, Howard. We're going to have to leave it there because uh, that money that we have to earn to pay our way, at least half of it anyway, is just uh, knocking at our door and saying, play me, play me. So we're going to take a break. Listening to uh, Manx Radio's uh, Man in Line off the back of present politics, a lot of calls coming in. I'm going to mention things to do with the pensions legacy, but first, Robert has been uh, holding on the phone, and this is to do Meals on Wheels. Robert, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, uh, uh, John. Um, Your one o'clock news bulletin repeated the PR issue that the DHSS have put out about the replacement service is grossly misleading. What is offered is no more than what Tesco have been providing for years. It's a weekly delivery of groceries. It's no more than that. I have rung both companies to discuss with them what it is they're going to provide. Neither of them seem to know. They've got nothing uh, on record. The people who answer the phone don't know what they're going to do. But all they're saying is it's a weekly delivery of groceries. Now, contrast that with what happens at the moment from uh, AGIOM. Uh, They call daily to uh, several hundred uh, uh, people in this uh, category. And they make sure that they're alive and kicking or they don't need the doctor calling or or whatever. It's as much a safety thing uh, um, for the welfare of elderly people uh, as much as the provision of food. Can't you say, Robert, you've got an enthusiastic audience here. Um, The the two guests are busy nodding their heads there. Uh, David Cretney. Do you agree with what he said? Well, I certainly agree. And that was a point I tried to make earlier and have tried to make since this was announced, is that the we're going to have more people, hopefully, living longer in their own homes. And part of that will require to be a proper, adequate service where people will be called upon to make sure that they're all right. I mean, it's no good just saying, oh, well, we're going to... So it's rather haphazard at the moment. Uh, well, I believe so. I believe so. Chris Thomas? Um, No, the most important point in this call is to separate out two things. One is the delivery of the food from the service, the social care that uh, is provided. And I I hope uh, the minister and and all the officials are listening because I've heard them make pledges about the second point, about the social care and how that will carry on. And I really do hope it does carry on. And all that we've done is we've separated out the food bit. Um, That's it, really. Alison? I agree with everything that uh, both David and Chris have said. I think... We need to look after our ageing population, not just drop food off. We need to, you know, knock on the door, have a chat with them, check everything's OK. Um, you know, it's not just as simple as delivering a meal. Robert, uh, there are obviously our studio guests here are in agreement with what you have to say. Yeah, well, I hadn't quite finished. Oh, I'm There's sorry. Also the nature of the food. Uh, it comes, as I understand it, from the hospital kitchen, for which age I um, pay, which is why... Uh, the much originally published figure of 350 that Kate Beecroft banded about is a fixture of uh, uh, poor arithmetic uh, uh, because AJ paid 225 back for the food from the hospital. But this uh, food is uh, balanced, it's got vegetables with it, and it's chilled. If you're going to rely on a weekly delivery, then it cannot be other than frozen. And it won't be the same balanced meal. Right. So what would you like to see? What do you think should be happening? 
I think it needs to continue with the existing service. Right. OK, thank you very much, um, Robert. You put a good point there and you put it well. Um, let me just, before I go to our next caller, mention this. Uh, this is from Rob uh, Callister, the MHK. Chris mentions the £58 million legacy from 2021-22, but forgets to mention the £43 million already paid by the departments from 21-22, i.e. the taxpayer. Chris Thomas. Uh, it's the employer, all public services provided by public servants, and it's people who pay for public servants and pub to deliver public service. So, yeah, Rob's figures are correct. The, the cost of providing pensions isn't only the, the, def the, the, the difference between the income and expenditure. It also includes the contributions from employees and employers, both of which are going up. And just while you're on, what do you think the impact from our, this is for a question from our listener, uh, the impact on our economy uh, would be for 2018 if the EU puts the Isle of Man on a financial blacklist on Tuesday? Anyone here know whether we're going to be on this financial blacklist? It's much bandied about. Y you probably do, John. You've probably got really good sources inside <laughs> Brussels, but I don't. And it's well, there's a, very a lot going on behind the scenes that we don't know about as far as the government is concerned. Presumably, we're hoping officials are busy going back and forth to London, making sure we're not on any blacklist. Because yeah, we say we're whiter than white. You know, very much, and more than just um, politicians and officials moving between places, I can assure you that there's been lots of correspondence and work behind the scenes. Let's just go to a caller, George. Uh, George, uh, good afternoon to you. Um, yeah, your good subject, afternoon, John. Your, your subject is releasing equity from property in the Isle of Man. Just yeah, explain your ideas. Um, I've got, we've got her stage now, life now, where due to health problems, and uh, we're both on retirement pens from my wife and I, um, but nothing else. Um, Due to illness in the latter part of my life, I had to surrender all policies and insurances and things like that. So we find ourselves just living on our old age pension, which we're finding extremely difficult. Um, now, I made some inquiries with these companies that advertise on the telly concerning releasing capital in your property. Now, they all seem anxious to do it, but they say, we'll ring you back with the details, and nobody ever rings back. Now, I found out the reason for this. It can't be done on the Isle of Man. Um, because there is not the adequate legislation set up on the Isle of Man to safeguard um, the, the contract. Um, I wonder if any MHKs could throw, any, or any of your guests, I should say, throw any uh, light onto this, and if there's a possibility that the correct legislation may be put into force. There are a lot of people have mentioned this to me, and... Um, I've got to a desperate situation. We want to continue living in our own house, and some of these policies allow you to do that. We've tried to sell the house a couple of years ago, but with that rebuilding that's been on the island, old houses aren't selling. Now, presumably the income that you could get from savings uh, with the low uh, rates of interest it doesn't really help at all, does it? Uh, no. Uh, Chris, Chris Thomas was... Savings. This, this, this is part of the problem. We have no savings at all. We're living week to week and we're finding it very difficult. Whereas some money released from the property would help to improve our lifestyle and comfort no end. I mean, we haven't been able to afford a holiday for five years. You know, and just all the n normal things that people have, we, we've just had to rule all those out. I mean, Christmas is coming, you know, that's another thing. Now, I know one of these companies is Aviva, so I, I don't think we're talking about cowboy companies. I think we're talking about companies, reputable well, companies in England, that, that are doing this all the time for people in England. Well, I think Chris Thomas is going to help us here. Chris, you're nodding your head. Well, just please, could you leave information so I can uh, talk about your specific situation later? But the, the bigger picture that you do is, is correct. That's why I think it was Chris Robertshaw, Dewan Watterson and Peter Caron had a committee on the funding of care, which included equity release from homes. That report was passed to this um, new government, and I'm actually leading some work, and we hope by June or July to have come up with proposals for funding of care, including equity release, changing national insurance for arrangements. It's a massive challenge for us, but we hope we're going to have something positive to say about it by the summer. But it would be great to have your contact details, best wishes. So sorry to learn of all these difficulties. We do need to solve them. George, yes, you and your wife obviously sound in a desperate position. If you could leave your number, uh, Mr Thomas will get back to you and we'll see what can be done. Is that a, OK? Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, thanks to Thomas very much for for what he said there. Um, okay. Yeah, I'd like to talk to him and just tell him what our situation is. I mean, we're in council houses. We've worked hard all our life and managed to buy our homes. And uh, all our family have done the same thing 
all the family boys, girls, they're all in, in their own property. Um, they're not desperate for the money. They just say, oh, sell it. You know, you need the money now, sell it. Uh, but it's not as simple as that. We could sell it on the island, but we don't want to move, for one thing. And the other thing is, it wouldn't be at a very good price. We'll have to leave it there, George. But, yeah, have a word with Mr Thomas, and I'm sure he'll be able to help you. Um, thank you very much for calling, and I suppose there's quite a few other people out there who also have a, a, that sort of a problem. Can you just go to one or two of our um, callers, uh, one or two of our comments? I can't really, I don't really understand this one, uh, Chris Thomas. It's, uh, could Mr Thomas uh, not just implemented the London Borough policy on means testing on housing? Um, it does that, uh, presumably there's a system in London which is used for this, and he's, Asif is saying, don't just copycat that, but make one suit the Isle of Man. Yeah, we have to have a policy that suits the Isle of Man, so I think probably, I don't know specifically what the London to Borough one, but it, in the last couple of years there's been a, a system of what's called pay to stay. Um, that's something that we have to take into account as we uh, come up with our, our solution. I know the Minister Harmer, Minister of Infrastructure, is working on something, and as I've said before, I'd be very interested for the public to learn what proposals are and then we have to make choices. This comment, uh, hang on, we've got billions in the bank, but well, we haven't got billions, we've got one point something billion, um, but we've got to save 50 million pounds. Confused is that listener. Um, well, one's, um, one's about the, the assets that we've got, the savings that we've got, and the other one is about the um, money that we've got coming in each year and the money that we've got going out each year. Of course, government finances are complicated. That's why we have... Um, 100 or so Treasury officials raising money, choosing where to spend money. It's a difficult job, but th this government stepped up, up for it. Jerry, I'll be with you in just a moment. We're just going to take another break to pay the way as far as the station is concerned. We've got a lot of callers coming in and a lot of uh, people writing in as well. I know it sounds impossible, says a listener, but would the government ever invest in a new railway system on the island? Ramsey to Douglas, the same in Peel in the south. If you're able to view the hundreds of cars coming over the mountain every day uh, and going west and south, which has a big effect on the environment, I do think it's time to invest in the future. Something to think about during this break. You're listening to The Man in Line off the back of Preston Politics and uh, Alison Lynch, Moran Commissioners, Chris Thomas, the Policy and Reform Minister, and David Cretney is with me. Uh, and uh, we're going on to a number of subjects. But first, David Cretney wanted to answer um, a question that was posed earlier about uh, equity release on properties. Yes, I, I just think the whole housing question is very uh, complicated uh, and it's very, very important. And yeah, I'm glad that Chris is going to speak to that gentleman. But if I can have a just a quick advert, on Thursday night, you asked earlier how the Manx Labour Party formulates policy. On Thursday night, 7th of December, 7 o'clock, South Douglas Old Friend, we have an open public meeting and the subject is housing. So anybody who's got any views, please come along. Uh, we're going to go to Ken in a minute. First, with this suggestion from Liz. Why do we not stop family allowance after the second child? Um, yeah, Chris Thomas? Well, you got one? Uh, well in fact, the, the Population Challenges paper that uh, we're just about to publish suggests the exact opposite in one sense. Um, what we've got at the, at the moment is a problem with um, young people emigrating mm. and one of the mm. issues is the huge cost of children in the island. So we've got a whole range of policies mm. that we, we're going to propose that politicians think about. Ken, uh, joining us now. This is the old age pension. We talked about this earlier. Ken, yes, you're, you're concerned about the figures, presumably, well, are you? No, I'm not, I'm not concerned. I'm just wondering, as the Isle of Man's broken away from the UK, supposedly... Uh, when the new Manx pension is going to be brought out, the supplement obviously is going to go down. But my main concern is about the women who were born in '55. We couldn't do anything about it because we were aligned with the UK. But the women that were Manx women born in '55 and '56 who have been moved from '65 to '66 without any regard to the getting letters or anything like that, I'd have thought because we were broken away, we might be able to do something for them. Let's just move that to David Cretner, because uh, he was obviously listening with interest there. Can you? Well, I was listening with interest because lots of females have contacted me about this subject. Uh, it does seem very unfair. Uh, th this, again, was something which, that was discussed in the last Tin World. Uh, they talked about breaking away from the uh, triple lock, uh, the, the, and the, Uni the United Kingdom Conservative government have made further changes since then. If we, ha if we are our own... Um, in our own right um, doing all this about pensions then we should be able to consider 
things that we can do unilaterally. I mean, one of the things also that I was concerned about was uh, if people who are in manual work, if they're being required to work longer, this in itself presents difficulty. So it's a real, again, fairly complicated area. And I, I know Chris has been working on it. Yeah, Chris Thomas. David and I next week have got a presentation from Treasury Ken and uh, I think now our system is less estranged from the UK compared to what uh, Mr Tia talked about it being and I think in January you can expect uh, lots of information on the Timwood Order paper about pension ages and about the improvements to the situation and um, I think that that's about all I can say but it's very much a live issue and by January we should there should be more certainty for everybody. I, I acknowledge the issue that you've raised about women of that um, of that age I guess if that's Mr. okay. Mr Harm has been trying to do well he's been asking questions but he doesn't seem to be getting very far he seems to be coming up a bit against a brick wall which might appear it doesn't seem to be a brick wall in this uh, studio, actually, Ken. No. <laughs> so, but in January, um, Treasury will be coming with a report on proposals. Alison? Okay, thank you. Oh, right, that's okay, is it? Thanks, Ken. Um, but just a couple of uh, other things that have come in uh, as far as the emails are concerned. Uh, do you think the MHKs who get into government on the back of a political party ticket should resign and stand for re-election if they resign for that party? That's obviously off the back of Julie Edge. Well, um, yeah. Uh, Bill Malarkey didn't, Peter Caron didn't, um, Zach Hall didn't. Uh, no, I don't. I, I think that Julie Edge will face the electorate in several years' time, or is it three, three years' time, uh, and at that stage the electorate will, will take a, a view on her performance over the five years. It's just good. I think, is it Sin, is it? C-Y-N, Sin? Yes. Sin, yeah. You say that um, equity release is available on the island. It is. A friend of ours did this about seven or eight years ago. It has to be done legally through an advocate. And the advocate he used was John Wright. I don't know, is John Wright still practising? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It had to be done through him, but he did arrange equity release for him, yes. So it is available on the island. We're going to have to take another of those breaks. Thanks, into the last 10 minutes of the programme, which has been quite uh, a hectic uh, two hours, and my guests are here with me in the studio. That's uh, David Cretney, Chris uh, Thomas, and um, Alison from Around Commissioners, Alison Lynch here. Um, from you, you're contributing as well. As I am, and this is, we can say, yes, it's happened. As I understand, a cleaning help for an hour free of charge is being withdrawn as well. Is that true? Asks one of our listeners. Chris Thomas, it seems a bit petty, that, doesn't it? Yes. I don't know how much, it, how much it's going to save. It's yes. not going to save millions. Manx, Manx Home Care, as I understand it, has not had the contract renewed from January. Uh, and that distresses some, a lot of people, I would imagine, David Cretney, if they can't keep their home tidy, if they're incapable, basically, of keeping their home tidy. I just think the whole thing's very unfortunate. That it's been done on a piecemeal basis, and I do believe that there, are, there must be bigger ticket items that wouldn't have the detrimental effect that these are having. Uh, joining us is Charles Buster Lewin. Uh, good afternoon, Mr Lewin. Uh, you say means testing, and obviously you were in Braddon Commissioners for a long time, you'd know this, means testing for public sector housing mechanism uh, was actually uh, set out in the past. So it, there is one out there. Well, myself and Mike Fell, the late Mike Fell um, from KPMG, we actually created the pointing system that everybody is now using. But it's been changed a little. Uh, but at the same time, we were looking at this issue of means testing. So the commissioners commissioned KPMG, and they went to the banks and all the stakeholders and everything, and came back with a very comprehensive report. How long ago is this? In the mid-90s. So we went and seen Dolgie, and they said fine. We went and seen Claire Christian, and she said, yes, that's good, because it's going to reduce the money that they have to pay out for pensions and we went to Treasury and that's where it was blocked because what the report was showing was that the actual true cost of social housing there is I mean you know we accept the principle it was just that the rent went to the size of the house and not to the person but it did show a reduction in rent take but the real benefit of it was and I can use this as an example. There was a young couple moved in. He didn't have a very good job. Six months later down the line, he's a policeman. So his earnings all of a sudden go up. And people were saying, well, what's he doing in there? Well, if it was a, a um, means tested, he would then have to decide for himself whether he wanted to pay 
just two hundred pound a week, or whether he went to a mortgage. So it had so many positives, and we had the tenants in all. I think it was eight groups, and we said to them, "We can it over your lifespan. Don't we get it now?" And ninety six percent supported it, and it was so simple to administer that all we did was we didn't want to know there was KPMG, the person could go along there, show them the tax assessment form and that was sufficient. So it's based on tax assessment? It was based on your actual tax, tax assessment but to make sure that you know, neither I or the commissioners could be in any way, you know, I could say oh and you earn 50,000 and somebody said well you got that. We never got to see that, well we would never have got to see that information. Um, we'll have to move on because we've got a couple more callers to come in. But can I just run that past our listeners, um, Buster, and just say, d- have you heard of that uh, system, Chris Thomas? Yeah, uh, thanks, Buster. How are you? Um, we've, we've, uh, yeah, th- uh, you've alluded to some other problems that we've got to solve, and I'm glad that um, Mr. Fail and KPMG worked with Braddon commissioners in the past to to look at them. So yeah, it's, the solution's got to work for uh, work, and I'm, I can assure you that Treasury, Cabinet Office, and Infrastructure Department are working on schemes like the one that you described trying to tackle the issues we also want to create opportunities for key workers housing and we've got some new thinking to bring into the equation you'll have to watch that space um, but I would hope that within the next three or four months we'll be able to make announcements I'm sure the infrastructure minister will be doing that Alison Lynch that sounds like a warehead doesn't it it does Um, I don't think means testing would be totally based on uh, somebody's income tax return Um, you with your income tax return you submit a, a certificate of debit interest if you do the paper version online, you don't have to send in any certificates. Um, but you don't have to provide a certificate of credit interest. So there's, you don't have to um, uh, you know, put down on paper how many tens of thousands you have in the bank. Uh, David Credney, um, I think it's important that some system is worked out, isn't it? Yes, I mean, uh, as Chris has said already, various departments are looking at this. I I just, as far as I'm concerned, the important thing is that people who cannot afford the increases which are imposed on them have a fairer solution. We've got lots of subjects we haven't covered this nearly at the end of the programme, including the meat plant, which I wanted to get to, and of course the deep uh, the the berth that was considered out here for the cruise liner. But Stephen is joining us on the phone. Stephen, uh, your your thoughts? Sorry, you're on Meals and Wheels again. Yes, I'm afraid so. Uh, good afternoon, John. Good I have afternoon, to keep listeners. it fairly short because we're coming I'll up be, to I'll end. be concise as I can. Mm. First, I'd just like to say that Meals on Wheels charity that provides this. It was very sad that there was no co- proper consultation with them because despite the numerous PR people that government employed will not lie down. I think a consultation would have uh, brought forward all the issues that are raised. Chris Thomas mentions splitting them, and he seems to miss the point completely that a, that a visit by a non-government person is a, is a friendly chat and a, and a meeting with a government uh, official is completely uh, not that. Can, can I just um, run something past you Stephen because we've had this from a listener. Could the post office deliver the meals from a hospital kitchen for meals on wheels? Well maybe they could, maybe the they could. The postman's a know. friendly face, postwoman's well, a friendly like face. To, j- just go on to say is, is this going to lead on to the privatisation in of, of the catering services in Nobles hospitals and will this Timwell, despite all the, the good things that it may do, will they be remembered as a mean-spirited and uh, and um, a poor public-facing Timwell to those people uh, who are in need, such as older people. And, um, uh, you know, in, in regard to the question of making our health system the worst uh, of the British Isles, how do they react to the uh, the, uh, the label that's been put on this Timwald of Tory Timwald? Is that fair, or do they think that, that they've got to do something to change? Because I will remember... Let, let me run that past them, because we're coming to the end of the programme, Stephen. I'll have to run that. Can I have your views on that, on Stephen's points there? A Tory Timwald. No, th- this... Um, hello, Stephen. This um, Timwald, this government, I hope, will be remembered as one that wasn't mean-spirited, but actually faced the challenges and helped what uh, I think was Bill Henderson called middleman. I think um, you're probably right. Harold Macmillan and the One Nation Tories are more like the council ministers and other people, if you're going to use British analogy. But um, I hope we face the challenges, and there are lots in society. Tory, Timwald, fair criticism, don't correct me? Well, uh, I I don't want it to be a Tory, Timwald. I want 
it, I'm, I'm still a big supporter of Miles Walker from 1986, mm-hmm. where he said the uh, the development of a prosperous and caring society. That's what I wanted to see and our island to be. I want it to be inclusive. At the moment, uh, as as uh, Stephen said earlier, there uh, there is lack of consultation in, in a number of areas that have been. Uh, taken forward by the Department of Health and Social Care. They need to get their act together better. We're going to have to close it there. We've come to the end of the programme. Just to give you this uh, from a call. I received the letter about cleaning yesterday, so can confirm it is being stopped. It finishes in January. Thank you very much indeed, my guests. It's been an entertaining programme. Uh, Alison Lynch, Moran Commissioners, Chris Thomas, Policy and Reform Minister, and David Cretney. Obviously, so much experience in Timwald and, and the Keys, yeah, an MLC at the moment. That's it. We've now reached news time at two o'clock. Thank you for your participation. Thank you.